How many of you watched some good Christmas movies this holiday season? Yeah? Yeah, I was getting a lot of phone calls and emails and texts about Pastor. I, I, I had to go check out that movie Elf or National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation or, or Chris, uh, It's a Wonderful Life or whatever those movies were. We, we talked about all these Christmas movies and how they relate to our lives. And if you missed it, they're all online as well as the kids singing uh, with us in worship last week. Wasn't that fun? My goodness, we should get the kids involved every service. Every grandmama and great-grandmama came out for that. It was packed in here. It was a lot of fun. We talked about Christmas at the movies, but tonight, I'm sorry, this morning, we're going we're gonna to change gears a little bit because Christmas is almost over. Can I get an aww? How many of you have already got your Christmas presents out of the way? Okay, how many of you have got your Christmas decorations down? Wow. <laughs> woo <Woo-hoo. laughs> All right, how many of you got a Christmas present this year? Just show me your hands. Let's see them. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, okay well, I don't, I don't want to bring up any bad, bad resentment. So if you didn't get a Christmas present, we have some mints out in the foyer. We'll give them to you so that you feel that we love you at least. This Christmas, I, I got to thinking, in fact, me and, uh, me and, and uh, uh, some of the guys were talking about before service, I asked the question, what was your favorite Christmas present that you have ever gotten? Why don't you think about that for a second? What is the favorite, your best, most happiest Christmas gift moment you have ever had? Just think about it. All right, everybody, can you think of one? If you can't think of one, make it up at least. All right, now take a second, turn to your neighbor and tell them what your favorite Christmas present was. It was the year that I got a keyboard. It was, it was awesome. Oh, yeah, that too, when we got married. That was a good Christmas present too. <laughs> you know, Christmas is a funny time of the year. In fact... Um, I'm going to edit this because I noticed we have some children. So let me, let me edit this real quick. Uh, this Christmas was interesting because each one of our children get a, got a big Christmas present this year and a few little things from Santa. Are you all with me? You all know what I'm saying right here? Okay. Uh, so, but Santa messed up and accidentally left one of the Christmas presents in Alabama before the kids could open it. So uh, he delivered it to the wrong house. But thankfully, Mom and Dad made a trip so that uh, after Christmas morning when he was like, hey, why did everybody else get more? Because Santa delivered your present to the wrong house. We had to go get it. Who is a bad parent right here? <laughs> but luckily, I can still blame it on Santa Claus. Hallelujah. I tell you what, this year for Christmas, we, uh, we made a rule in our house. My wife and I decided we are not going to get each other Christmas presents. We're going we're gonna to focus on the kids. However, being the wife that I have, the amazing woman she is, didn't listen to that rule whatsoever, although I did. So, I, again, bad husband. Um, and I wake up Christmas morning, of course, to no presents, except in my stocking. And there's a little something in my stocking that I'm going to be honest with you. Almost brought tears to my eyes. There was a little something that my wife delicately placed in my stocking that made my Christmas quite possibly one of the best Christmases I've had in a while. Now, you're probably wondering, Pastor, what in the world did she get you? Yeah, boy, was it a new gun? Nope, that would have been good. Keep that in mind for next year. <laughs> was, it, was it something, something, something fun? Yeah, what was it? She got me six pairs of socks. <laughs> Now, you may think that that don't mean squat, but in my house, socks are a hot commodity because everybody's feet are growing, and when feet start growing, you know whose socks they want to take? Mine. <laughs> Nobody wants to take the twin socks. Nobody wants to steal mama's socks. Everybody steals daddy's socks. Anybody else have that problem in their house, or is it just me? Because I'm going to tell you right now, when I come out and my socks, they say Dickies over the front of them because they're good boot socks, you know, real thick and... Y'all don't like socks like I do, but they're real good socks. And I, I can see the kids walking around or my wife walking around. I go, those are my socks. They say Dickies on them. Give me my socks. See, I only have six pairs of good socks. So if you take one of my socks, then I miss an entire day worth of fresh sock wearing. Oh, Jesus. Y'all can tell I got, it. I got something bitter in my spirit this morning. I got I to gotta work on that. So my wife got me six more pairs of socks. I have 12 pairs of socks. I can wear clean socks 12 days in a row. Now, that may not mean much to y'all, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's something about your pastor that I'm going to just be vulnerable with you because, see, if I was filthy rich, if I won this Powerball lottery that's up to God knows however many millions, which, let me just say, not many pastors will tell you this, but it, you can't win if you don't play. So I'm just saying, if you paid your tithes, make sure you tithe if you win. That's all I'm saying. That's between you and God from there on out, okay? 
But if I happen to win the, the lottery, let me tell you what I would do. And I know it's shallow. I know it's, it's, it's just silly. But don't judge me, okay? Nobody's asking your opinion right now. If I was filthy rich, I would have a brand new pair of socks every day. Anybody, anybody else like that? Anybody else like putting on, opening the bag where it's got some air in it from some other third world country where they probably made it in a sweatshop, and you put these nice thick socks on your feet? Anybody else just go, whoa, you like that? Am I the I'm, Okay, there's me and another person. The rest of you think I'm a freak. <laughs> Be honest. You like a brand new, fr fresh pair of socks. And quite frankly, if I had the money and I was filthy rich, you know what i do at the end of the day? I wouldn't put them in the dirty basket. I would put them in the garbage can, never to be worn again, so that the next day, another brand new, fresh pair of socks. Now, let me tell you something. I am a freak, and I know it. I have taken the time to figure out how much that would cost me on an annual basis. I'm not going to share with you the number because it's unrealistic. But if I was rich, that's what I would do. You know why? Because I like freshness. I like new things. How many of you like new things? Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever bought a brand new car? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have ever bought your pastor a brand new car? Raise your hand. See, we need to see more hands up. That would be a good time. You've bought a brand new car. There's something exciting about a brand new car. Nobody else has been in it before. Nobody else has spilt the, the McDonald's french fries down in the cracks that never deteriorate for some reason, never disintegrate. They're still there from 30 years ago. There's something about a brand new car. It's got that new car smell. Right before we moved to, uh, to Tennessee, we came down for a weekend, and our very own Jim Burrow let us borrow his car because we flew in. We needed a car to drive around and check out the area. So he let us borrow his new car. What is that a car again? It's a, the red one, an Impala. An Impala? Okay, so he bought this brand new Impala, and it smelled like a fresh car. And every time my wife and I got in and out of the car, we're like, oh, this smells so good. It's been a year, and it still smells like a fresh car. I don't know what he does to it, but we were afraid to eat in it. We were like, he'll know. If we eat in it, he'll, he'll smell it. We don't know this guy. Now, I have no problem eating in your car. But then, I didn't know you. So, I didn't want to rob him of that newness. There's something about that newness. I've never had a new car. I've always had used cars. I, I remember one of my favorite used cars that had 350,000 miles on it when it was brand new to me. It didn't have a fresh new car smell. Anybody understand what I'm saying to you? It didn't have no fresh anything on it except the air freshener I put in it. And even that didn't last long. There's something about freshness and newness that's exciting. I, I, I know that there's some people in here, you like new things so much that you do something that I call emotional shopping. Any ladies in here or men, they won't answer, so you answer for them. Any, any of your wives or girlfriends or fiancés or whatever they are, any, any ladies in here who are emotional shoppers, that they go shopping when they're emotional? Okay, hands, people are like, pff, men are like. Pff. There's something about newness that brings us comfort. When I moved out of the house uh, when I was 18 years old, I moved to Illinois, and I left my mama. And I'm a mama's boy. Any mama's boys out there? What? what? Mama boys? I was a mama's boy. I'm telling you right now. And when I left my mama, I cried through a few states. I'm a man enough to admit it. And then when I got into Illinois, I went broke. You know why? Because I went shopping. I bought tools I didn't need. I bought electronics I didn't need. I just bought stuff. I didn't have the money. You know why I bought it? Because I was emotional. See, there's something about newness that brings us comfort, brings us peace. There's something about freshness that's exciting and we long for it. New things bring comfort and excitement for some, but then there's, there's other people that newness brings you fear and anxiety. If I was to say, friends, you're going to have to move and buy a new house this week and move all your stuff, some of you would go into meltdown because the thought of having to clean out your house and pack it up and move into a new home would bring anxiety, wouldn't it? See, not everybody in here loves new things. As we come into a new year, we think of things that could be made new. How many of you in 2014 would like a new body? Okay, y'all. see, y'all are sleeping on I know you got that, that fudge is sitting heavy this morning, all right? You got ham, you got so much turkey, you're clucking, okay? Now listen to me. How many of you would like a new body this year? I'm looking out here, some of y'all need a new body. Let's just be honest. There's some of you that need some new things happening. Some of you need, you know, a new hairstyle or need to lose a few pounds. And I know you're thinking, hypocrite, preacher. 
Hey, I'm with you. I want a new body in 2014. I want a new thing. There's people in this room, you want a new job this next year. There's something about a new change of work and change of pace that's exciting. You want something new. There's people in this room, you want your finances to change. You want your marriage to be refreshed. You want your your relationship with your children to be new this year. See, I think that God is into new things. I think God is very into new things. But the problem is he's waiting for us to catch up. See, Isaiah 43, 19. If if you have your Bibles turned there, if not, it's in your bulletin and it's on the screen. Isaiah 43, 19 says this. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Everybody say new. New. Oh, there we go. Everybody, you you with me this morning. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? See, Isaiah's writing is to the children of Israel, and it's coming at this bleak period of history. They are in captivity. They have lost everything that they thought was their own that they would be able to keep forever. They've lost it all. And they were homesick for the land and the blessing God had promised them. And yet God brings this encouraging verse of Scripture, this encouraging prophetic word in Isaiah chapter 43. In the midst of everything falling apart, in the midst of everything, everything going wrong, God sends this prophetic word. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now, let's put this into perspective. You've got these Israelites that are going, well, you best be doing something. We've lost everything. We are in captivity. All the stuff we were holding on to as our promises are now gone. You you best do something, God. And he says, hey, I'm already doing a new thing. It's not I'm going to do a new thing. It's that I'm already doing a new thing. So let me take a second to clarify something. Because I don't want you to to misunderstand me and misread me. See, when God says he will do a new thing, it's not a new thing to him. Nothing's new to God. It's not new to God that your finances took a nosedive. It's not new to God that your marriage is, is falling apart. It's not new to God that your children are driving you up a wall. It's not new to God that your relationship has become dry. It's not new to God. What it is, is it's new to us. See, God is not saying, I'm doing something new to me. He's saying, I'm doing something that's new to you. The things God is wanting to do is a new thing in us. So let me ask you a question. What in your life are you needing God to do a new thing in? What is it that you're needing God to do a new thing in this morning? If you were to be honest, would you say, Pastor, I need God to do something new in my marriage. We're just, we're not, we're not hitting on all cylinders. We're kind of butting heads a little bit. I need God to do something new. I need to fall in love with my spouse all over again. I need us to be rocking like we used to be. I need our marriage to be on fire. I need a new thing. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I need something new to happen in my finances. My finances are a mess. The debt's piling up. I don't know how to pay the bills. We're living from paycheck to paycheck, from penny to penny, never getting ahead, never being able to provide the life that we had hoped to provide. Pastor, I need a new thing in my finances. Maybe it's a a new thing in life in general. Maybe you've hit a wall. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I've kind of gotten into a rut. Things are just kind of, the wheels are spinning, and I'm not going anywhere. In fact, I feel like I'm doing the same thing day in and day out. There's no passion. There's no excitement. There's nothing that's happening. In fact, I feel like I'm dying on the inside. Now, you may go, well, Pastor, that kind of sounds grim and bleak. But what you don't hear are the voices that I hear echoing in my ears from friends and loved ones all throughout this room that say, Pastor, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated at where life is at. I'm frustrated that I'm still struggling with the same things. I need God to do a new thing. I need to, I need to stop struggling with the same sin patterns. I need, I need a fresh start. See, God is doing a new thing. The question is not, is God doing a new thing? Because in reality, He already is doing a new thing. Are you with me? He is doing a new thing. It's, His word says, behold, look, I'm doing it already. But how do we walk into that new thing? How do we wake up? How do we open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts? How do we get the wheels spinning? How do we move into the new thing that God is already doing? Well, the first thing is to change your focus. Why don't you write that down? Change your focus. 
When we read Isaiah 43, 19, we see this prophetic word. But what we've got to do is we've got to rewind just a little bit. We've got to go back a verse of Scripture to see what's happening. Because see, in Isaiah 43, 18, this is what he says. Remember, everybody say remember. Now, how many of you got a bad memory? Raise your hand. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. You have a bad memory, don't you? You don't remember things very well. Well, that's a lie. Because you do have some memories. It's not that you completely wiped away your past. You still remember certain things. In fact, this says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. You know, a memory can be a good thing, can it? It can also be a bad thing. How many of you have bad memories? Well, come on now. Notice the interaction. I'm trying to keep you awake here. You remember some of the rough moments in your life, don't you? You, you remember that, that bad Christmas memory. You remember that thing that that person said in your life, that teacher said or that preacher said or that parent said. You remember these little things, these little caveats, if you will, of moments that have happened in your past. See, we remember things sometimes to our detriment. Before God can say, behold, I'm doing all things new, he first says, remember not the former things. There's a reason. Because in order to change our focus, to change the way we look at life, to change the way we may look at our circumstance, we've got to stop looking at what was. We've got to stop looking in the past in order to move forward. Now, that may be easier said than done. And and the reality is we have different people in this room. So let me break that down for you this morning. You have to let go of your past failures. Before you can walk into the new thing that God is wanting to do in your life. Let, 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 me, let me give another example. Before you can walk into the newness of your marriage. Before you can walk into creating an incredibly hot marriage. You've got to let go of the past failures in the marriage. How many of you know there's past failures in any relationship? And before you can walk into something new, you've got to let go of the past. There's a, there's a, a, a radio show that we used to listen to in Alabama called Rick and Bubba. Anybody heard of Rick and Bubba? Rick and Bubba, okay, well, kind of on my own on that one. Yeah, it's not syndicated here yet, but it's a great show. Two Christian fat guys that do a radio show, that's what they call themselves. And they used to talk about the thing called the book of blame. They would say, well, my wife got out the book of blame the other day. And I thought, boy, that is so funny and true. Isn't it amazing how we can remember the things in our past that we want to blame others for we remember our past failures we remember the things that have gone bad and we want to bring them and drudge them back up the problem with drudging up past failures is that it it does not allow us to move forward into the new thing God is already doing Israel had some failures in fact God gave them a temple they gave them idol worship God gave them truth and they lived and proclaimed a lie God gave them his commands and they lived like they were suggestions God gave them wealth And they used it to abuse the poor. God gave them them himself and he gave them nothing except rejection. The children of Israel knew failures. If you've ever read the Old Testament, it's like, come on guys, get a grip. Quit messing this stuff up. Do you understand what you're doing? Get it together. The children of Israel did not deserve to receive anything new from God. Yet he still loved them and earnestly wanted to help them change. Notice God's message. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Let it go. Listen, I know that you messed up. Let it go. I know that the marriage had mistakes. Let it go. I know that you screwed up as a parent. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I know that you've made mistakes. I know that you're a sinner, but let it go. Let's move on. Let's move forward. We've got to let go of our past and our failures. If you've ever been with children, you'll know that there's a little thing kids like to do when it's not going in their favor. They call this magical word. This magical word that changes everything, changes the entire dynamics of the game. Are y'all ready? Because you're not too young or too old to use it. Redo. I'm calling a redo. We're starting over. We were playing Old Maid last night, but they changed it and Christianized it to Old Man and put Jesus pictures on the cards. I don't know. It was a gift the kids got for Christmas, so we're playing that. And of course, Daddy's winning, because when Dad's playing a game with the kids, Daddy's in it to win it, okay? There is no, oh, yeah, you you won. No, you win because you earned it, all right? What was I talking Oh, yeah. 
So we're playing this card game, and of course I'm winning because that's what dads are supposed to do. And, and I'm winning, and, and, and what, what happens? Micah goes, uh, redo. No, we got to start over. Redeal the cards. What do you mean redeal the cards? You want to redo because I'm winning. You're losing. Right. That's, that's right, Daddy. I want to redo because I'm losing. It's so true, though. Kids do it all the time. But what we don't realize is that even as adults, hear me, hear me, please. You can call a redo. When things aren't going the way you planned, you can call a redo. When, 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 when the marriage is not firing on all cylinders, you can look your spouse in the eyes and say, let's call a redo. When you find yourself dealing with a sin pattern and you find yourself with the regrets from your past and you find yourself with the weight and the conviction of your past failures and sins, you can call out to God and say, hey God, I need a redo. God, I need to start over. God, I need my past to be wiped away. And that's what he's telling Israel. Listen, guys, I know you've messed up. But if we're going to move forward, you've got to forget all the past failures. But it's not just our past failures we've got to let go of. We've got to let go of our past victories. Write that down. You've got to let go of your past victories. Now you may go, well, well Pastor, why is that? You know, our victories are, our victories are what we, we, we hold on to and encourage ourselves with. Yes, however, there's also some negative side to victory. See, Israel had left Egypt. They had conquered the land of Canaan. They had fought off prospective conquerors. And they even survived a split in their own country. But yet now they're in captivity. And if you watch what Israel does this whole time in captivity, all they do is they whine about what they are missing and they talk about the glory days. Anybody remember the glory days? You know, the glory days. When you were thin, trim, you had energy, your bones didn't hurt, you got out of bed and didn't need WD-40. You remember the glory days. The glory days when life was easy, B.C., you know, before children. You know, the glory days. The glory days when you had a good paying job and the money was just, ooh, it was rolling in. The glory days. You know, the glory days when, when your walk with Christ was so easy because there wasn't a whole lot of opposition. I remember the time in my life I really felt like I was the most spiritual. I'm, I'm saying with the fingers, like this, spiritual because I didn't realize what I was talking about. But I felt like the time of my life when I was the closest to God, when the glory days, if you will, was when I was in a program called Master's Commission up in Illinois. And do you know that every day for four hours, they scheduled our lives to go into a sanctuary and pray every day for four hours. You know how spiritual you are when you pray four hours every day? And if you didn't show up, you got in trouble. The glory days when life was easy. When somebody scheduled your life and made sure everything happened at the right time. See, we all have glory days. In fact, churches have glory days. Every church does. I remember my last church when I, when I came and we started talking about what, what needs to happen to kind of reboot. And all anybody wanted to talk about was the glory days when they had 15 buses that ran on a weekly basis picking up children all over the community. 15 school buses. That's a lot of children. The glory days when this place was full of kids. The glory days when lives were being changed. Friends, let me tell you something. The glory days aren't the days gone by. They're the days that are ahead of us. They're the things that have not yet happened. We cannot depend on our past victories to sustain us. Please listen to that. We cannot depend on our past victories to to sustain us. If you're in this room and you've won a spiritual battle, maybe, maybe you've won over an addiction. Maybe you've won over a a mental battle, an emotional battle, a physical battle. You may have won over that, but you can't hold on to that to sustain you from here on out. God needs to do a new thing. You've got to let go of your past failures and your past victories. I've got to hurry. The second thing, you've got to change your focus. You've got to change your way of thinking. The second thing is you've got to clarify your focus. You've got to clarify your focus. Discover what God's wanting to do for you. Because, friends... Discovering what God wants to do for you does not happen in a moment. It takes time. It takes time of really getting after his heart. Isaiah 43, 19, the second part of that verse, I love it. And I I don't know how you hear God's voice, but I hear God with a hint of sarcasm. In Isaiah 43, 19b, it says, do you not perceive it? Hey, don't you get it? That's how I, that's how I kind of read that. Hey, wake up. Don't you see it? Are you blind? Are you just deaf? 
Are you just dumb? Don't you see it? I don't know about you, but I don't always see it. I don't always see what God's wanting to do. I don't always, I don't always perceive it because, because my humanity, my wants, my selfishness gets in the way. Somebody, somebody listen to me this morning. My selfishness gets in the way, and I don't always perceive what God is blessing because I want him to bless me. I want him to bless me over here. Hey, God, I'm over here doing my thing. Come bless me. But what God's saying is, hey, I'm over here blessing this. Don't you perceive it? Get your butt over here, boy. That's how I, that's how I view God. Come on, boy, don't you see what I'm blessing? Get over here, you go, oh, boy, I tell you. That's how I view God. And I'm going to be honest with you, it takes time to perceive and to clarify. It takes time to change our way of thinking. That word perceive there means yada. Say yada. See, look, you done learned something. All educated. Yada. To know by seeing. Hear that? To know by seeing. To acknowledge. Be aware of. To understand. All by seeing. You've got to look at it. You've got to see it with your own eyes. In order to see what God is wanting to do, we've got to first of all see yourself as God sees you. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those of who are in Christ Jesus. You've got to see yourself through the eyes of God. When I was growing up, we, we had a saying, you've got to see it through a God lens. Because I don't know about you, when I look in the mirror, besides seeing an overweight white dude, what I see is a man of, with failures. I see a man that at times has a short temper. I see a man that struggles with sarcasm. I see a man that has struggles in his mind and in his heart. I see those things when I look in the mirror. I don't know what you see, but hopefully I would assume you would see weakness as well. But what happens is oftentimes that's all we see. But if we'll take the time to see ourselves through God's eyes... If we could clarify our focus by seeing what God sees. And you may be here and go, Pastor, that sounds, that sounds like a pipe dream. How could I see myself the way God sees me? Well, you start by asking. Ask. Uh, I don't want to give you homework, but hear me out this morning. Let's keep it simple. Ask Him. God, how do you see me? Whereas I may see myself as a broken, worthless vessel, God sees me as somebody that's usable, a mighty man. When I see a weakling, when I see a a flesh and blood struggling human, what God sees is a mighty man. What I see is a man of struggles. What I see is an inadequate father, an inadequate husband, an insignificant man. God sees a man that is led to, to raise up a mighty family, to be the father and the husband. What God sees is different than what I see. And the only way to clarify our focus is to see ourselves as God sees us. Also, we've got to see our potential as God sees it. We've got to see our potential as God sees our potential. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I want to prosper you. See, when we think about God, we think about our own limitations. Hear that. When we think about God, we think about our own limitations. I I need to make sure you catch that. That, That's money right there. When you think about God wanting to do something in your finances, when you think about God wanting wanting you to give $10,000 to missions, what you think is your ability. I can't. I don't have enough money. My job won't allow that. When, when, When you hear that God wants you and has for you to go on a missions trip, what goes through your mind is, I can't get off work. We limit God and his potential in our lives based off our own perspectives. When we'll start viewing God outside of our limitations and start seeing ourselves through the potential, our view of ourselves will completely change. I don't know about you, but I could fill this day with story after story about the things that God did that were beyond me. That if it was dependent on my limitations would never be a possibility. But if we would take the time to let go of our limitations... The potential is unbelievable. Friends, in this room, in this room are people that have yet to be called and submit to the call to be missionaries. I believe that. In this room are men and women of God who are going to do things so mighty in this community, it would blow your mind if you would allow God to speak them to you. 
and stop limiting him. There are people in this room that will give more financially and resource-wise to missions than you could possibly fathom. But unfortunately, all you're seeing yourself is through your own limitation. We've got to give them to God. The greatest step to embracing the new thing God wants to do in your life is that once you have changed your focus, clarified your focus, the third thing is to commit to your new focus. Change, clarify, commit. We don't like committing, do we? I'd ask you if you have commitment issues, but you'd probably lie to me. We, Faith and I deal with it all the time. People that have commitment issues. Ah, well, pastor, I don't want to get involved because then, then you're going to expect me to be there. Right. It's called commitment. I know. Crazy, huh? Pastor, I can't do that because it requires commitment. Pastor, I want to lose 50 pounds, but I, by golly, I can't commit to a gym membership. That's, that's every month. Pastor, I want to I wanna grow spiritually, but I'm not going to commit to coming to Wednesday night Bible study. Good Lord. Every Wednesday? Commitment's a hard thing for us. No matter where you're at in life, every one of us struggle with commitment in some form or fashion. We don't like committing to things. I had a friend in Michigan. And I'm, I, I've told you part of this story, but uh, he was a very, very uh, aggressive guy. <laughs> He's like, man, we need, to, we need to go ride our bicycles for like 100 miles. And I'm like, I don't even have a bicycle. He's like, dude, let's go swim a mile. Man, I don't, I don't even know how to swim. I, I like doggy paddle. No, dude, we can we just jump in and we'll swim. All right, I jumped in the pool, I swam a lap. And I'm like, uh-uh. come on, man, let's do it, let's do it. And then he comes up one day and he's like, hey, you want to do a triathlon? I'm like, no, I'm a fat white dude. I can't, I can't do that stuff. And he's like, come on, come on, come on. And I kept pushing it off, pushing it off. And then one day... He sent me an application and said, hey, let's sign up. I just signed me up. Okay, inbox. Just left it there. Did you sign up? Did you sign up? Did you sign up? I kept putting it off until I finally signed up and paid $65. Now listen, if I pay $5 to something, I'm going to get my $5 worth out of it because I am cheap. $65? It required me $65 to commit to something I didn't want to do. See, God's looking for our commitment. He's wanting to know how willing are you to commit to the great things he's wanting to do in your life. You may be here this morning and go, Pastor, I know what my marriage needs. I know what our family needs. I know what our finances need. I know what I need physically to change. I know what I need emotionally to change. Pastor, I even know what I need spiritually to change and to get it firing again. I know what I need, but I don't want to commit. See, commitment's a hard thing. Isaiah 43, 19, that verse ends like this. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What I love there is the word will. I, I love the fact that no matter, even despite the fact that we have commitment issues, God doesn't. Despite the fact that we struggle committing to anything, God doesn't. God says after, I'm going to do a new thing. If you'll forget about your past, forget about your weaknesses, forget about this stuff. If you'll, if you'll change your perspective, if you'll clarify your spec- perspective, if you will commit, I will commit as well. In fact, I will. Not I might, I could, I should, but I will make a way in the wilderness and in rivers in the desert. In fact, if you have your pens, why don't you circle that word, I will. Just circle it. I will. I am fully convinced that God is wanting to do something phenomenal in your life this year. If you've missed out on our Wednesday night class the past few weeks, you have missed out. We have talked about what it looks like to be proactive, to be purposeful in living the life that God's called us to live. I believe that God is wanting to to do a new thing in our church. I believe 2014 is going to be the greatest year this church has ever experienced. I believe that. I have no doubt. No doubt. I'm I'm not sitting here going, I think God might, because I know that his word says, I will make a way. I will make a way. I will make a way. If we'll just do two things. To truly commit to your new focus, you must do these two things. Number one, trust God. See, before the word will, it's preceded by the word I. We've got to trust God. You may be here and go, there's no way God could use me in another country. There's no way God could 
use me to give to this or to give to that. There's no way God could use me to witness to somebody, to share my faith. There's no way that God could use me to do anything significant in this life. There's no way. Well, if you'll trust him, you'd be surprised. If we would simply trust God, all things will be made new. He will make a way if you'll just trust him. And I know that that's easier said than done. There's people in this room, you have trust issues. If we could let go of those for just a moment and trust God, the things that he would do would blow your mind. The second thing, and probably the hardest of all of them, if you are going to completely commit, completely commit to a new focus this year, you're going to have to do something that's going to almost make you mad. You're going to have to move yourself. You're going to have to get off your butt and do something. Friends, let me tell you something. Your marriage isn't going to get better sitting in a recliner watching TV. You're not going to get the physical figure you want sitting at the buffet. Duh. We know those things. But let's take it a step further. Your finances aren't going to walk into a new thing unless you make a decision to work on your finances. That's why in February, we're asking 80% of our body to go through Financial Peace University with our church. All of us. To go through and to be proactive with our finances. To become healthy financially. It's not just going to happen by taking a charge card and going through Walmart looking for falling prices. Okay? You with me? Your family dynamics aren't going to change by spending time apart in the same routine. If you want to walk into the new thing that God is wanting to do in your life, then move yourself. Do something. I got a great text from a, a man in our church who is just growing spiritually leaps and bounds. I'm so excited about what God's doing in his life. And he sent me a very honest and vulnerable text and said, Pastor... This holiday season, I kind of feel like I'm getting out of my routine. I, I, just, I just kind of feel out of the, the, I'm just not doing the same thing. Well, we can sit there and go, hey, God bless me. Pour out your anointing. Do something new in my life. Or we can move ourselves. What we talked about was that during these seasons of our lives, one of the things that I do and I encourage you to do is I get a new devotional. Jump on you version, download a new devotional, free of charge. Change things up. Keep in the routine. Because, see, it doesn't just happen. It don't just happen. The weight doesn't just fall off. The money doesn't just pile up. The marriage doesn't just ignite on fire. The kids don't just automatically fall into line in the dynamics of the family. Love doesn't just find you. Stuff doesn't just happen. But if we will trust God and move ourselves, greatness is in store. The co-founder of the London School of Economics, Bernard Shaw, played the what-if game shortly before he died. Mr. Shaw asked a reporter, if you could live your life over and be anybody you've known or any person from history, who would it be? He thought for a moment. He said, I would choose, replied Shaw, I would choose to be the man George Bernard Shaw could have been but never was. I almost see it like this, that above us is a floodgate of blessings, a floodgate of purpose, a floodgate of opportunities that God is waiting to pour out on us. But he's waiting on us to trust him and to do something about it. We have got to change our focus. We have got to clarify it. We've got to commit to what God's wanting to do in our lives this year. I encourage you, write it down. Write the things down that God speaks to your heart. Write it down. Because God is doing a new thing. We just have to get on board. We've got to wake up. What if? What if God did a new thing in your marriage? What if you allowed him to? What if God did a new thing in your relationships or your friendships or your finances or your work life or school life? if God did a new thing in your spiritual life well he is he's just waiting on you 
I believe 2014 is a year of new beginnings. And the first new beginnings, it always starts with a new beginning with Jesus. So let me ask you a question. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just a private moment between you and God. This morning, we're talking about things becoming new. Jesus says that when you give your life to Him, the past is wiped away. That when you commit your life to Christ, your past is gone. The slate's been clean. In fact, we use the word here, a fresh start. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, and I'm not talking about just words, I'm talking about a decision. The past is wiped away. You make a fresh start and behold, all things are new. If you're here here this morning, maybe you're a guest or you've been here thousands of times, it doesn't matter. But you find yourself sitting in a chair at First Assembly on this last Sunday of the year. And if you were to be honest with yourself and ask the question, Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? Do you have a life-altering relationship with Him? Is He the Lord of your life? If He's not, I want to invite you this morning to make a fresh start. I'm not going to ask you to get out of your seat or move. This is a moment between you and God. But I'd like you to do me a favor. If you're here this morning, you'd say, Pastor, I want to make a fresh start with God. Would you just lift your hand up right where you're at? Just right where you're at. Just nobody's looking. Hey, I see your hand, bro. I see your hand. See your hand back there. I got you, bro. I'm going to pray for you. Who else? Who else? Pastor, that's me. I want to make a fresh start this morning. Today, I want to make a fresh start. Anybody else? Praise God. Can we pray together? Maybe you raised your hand. Maybe you wish you had. Again, it's a moment between you and God. But can we pray together out loud this morning? Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I want to let go of my past. By giving it to you. Jesus, come into my heart. and Wipe away my past. And be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning with your head bowed and eye closed. And you say, Pastor, I need God to do a new thing in my life in 2014. I'm not going to ask you what it is. It's irrelevant. But if you're here and you say, Pastor, I need God to do something new in my marriage. I need God to do something new in some of my other relationships and my finances. I need God to do something new in my physical body. I need God to do something new in my spiritual walk. I need this year to be a year of new beginnings. If that's you, right where you are, why don't you raise your hand? That's what I thought. That's everybody in the room almost. Let's stand to our feet and close out in prayer this morning. If you raised your hand, why don't you do like, if if you're comfortable with it, I've got my hands up as well. I'm surrendering. When we lift our hands, it's a sign of surrender. Can we just surrender our lives to Christ this morning? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that in this room are people just like me, flesh and blood. That God, we have a past that has failures and weaknesses. Our past is littered with mistakes. Our past is littered with high points and low points, victories and failures. But you're a God that wipes them all away. God, help us to let go of our past. Help us to see what you see. Open up our eyes to see what you see. Open up our hearts to hear you. Open up our minds to understand you. Clarify our focus and the things that you're wanting to do new in our lives. Help us to see him this morning. Jesus, I pray that you would help us in our commitment. God, I believe even now you're beginning to speak things specifically to people in this room. Even now you're beginning to speak specifics to make us significant this year. Father, I pray that right now those things that you're speaking to our hearts that we would commit to them that we would commit to becoming the men and women of God you've created us to be. That we would commit to whatever it takes to be the man or woman of God you've created us to be. Lord, we give you and commit this year that I believe will be the greatest year of our lives. In Jesus' mighty, his holy, in his perfect name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah.